Our scripture reading today is from Revelations chapters, excuse me one second, let me move that out of the way. Uh, Revelations chapters 21, verses 1 through 6, and 22 through 25. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Dana. Good morning. How's everyone doing? You're awake? Good. Uh, Well, today uh, we are in the final week of our teaching series called The Story of God. And in it, we've been looking at this big narrative of Scripture, this big arc of the Bible. We're sort of zoomed out so that when we're zoomed in, in our Bible study, when we're looking at particular verses and passages, we do so with context and understanding of the whole. And we've been thinking about this idea that the Bible is this library of writings that are both human and divine and together all point us to Jesus. And so for the last five weeks, we've been journeying through that narrative. We've seen how God created a good world and everything in it. But then his creatures, human beings, rebelled, allowing sin and death to come in and mar everything that God had made. But God, since that time and ongoing even to today, is on a mission. He's got his rescue plan to redeem and restore everything in creation. And the pinnacle of that rescue plan is the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the story so far. If you missed any of that, I want to encourage you to go catch up uh, on our website because there's really good stuff in those last four weeks. Now today, we turn to the very end of the story, the book of Revelation. Uh, If you're new to faith or new to uh, Jesus, first of all, we're so uh, glad you're here. You're so welcome. Uh, The book of Revelation is the very last book of the Bible. And just to be honest, it's a little weird. Right? As you even heard that come out of my mouth, right? As you, uh, I talked to one person in the lobby before the first service. I said, This is what we're doing. He was like, Oh gosh, like, okay, I might go back to my car, right? <laughs> right? Because if you're even a little bit familiar with the book of Revelation, you'll know that much of it, as you read it, seems a little bit like this image uh, from the children's, one of our children's Bibles. This is a real page from a real children's Bible. If you have third grade boys, they will love this, the Action Bible. Um, <laughs> But much of the time, Revelation feels like that. It feels like some kind of fantasy movie, an alternate universe. There's all of these weird beasts. The laws of physics and especially biology do not apply. The order of events is kind of on par with a badly written time travel novel. It's like, what do you do with the book of Revelation? At the same time, though... I really believe that God has something good and important for each of us as we come to this part of Scripture. And so I want to begin by talking a little bit about how do we even begin to understand this book. 
Now, the book of Revelation is written by the Apostle John, and he tells us right in the beginning, it's this fusion of three different genres of writing. He tells us first that it's apocalyptic in nature, and that was a known genre of Jewish literature. And what that means is it's filled with symbols and visions. And typically, typically what's happening in apocalyptic literature, uh, like Ezekiel and Daniel in the Old Testament, like some of the intertestamental literature, is that we're given this heavenly perspective on current events in light of how all of it will end in the future. Okay, so a heavenly perspective on current events, apocalyptic. But it's not only that. Thrown in there is some prophetic writing as well, like, again, the prophets in the Old Testament, where God is speaking his word through a particular person. And in that, what's most commonly happening is that the, God, through the prophet, is critiquing what's happening in the present and simultaneously looking forward to a future day. So both things are happening at once. So there's those two intermingled. And then there's this third thing that comes in because John tells us he's also writing a letter. He's writing to Christians in the first century, Christians who were spent most of their time in fear in a time of instability because they lived their lives in the shadow of the empire, specifically the Roman Empire at this time. And the book of Revelation uses language of Babylon to kind of talk about that. And so they were ruled and persecuted and often even killed by this Roman Empire. And their fear was, is the empire winning the battle for cosmic power? And it often seemed to them as though that were the case. So these three things are all kind of tangled together in Revelation, and it can be hard to kind of separate them out and unpick them and find out what's going on. And Christians have struggled with that very thing throughout all of Christian history. And uh, broadly, and this is just so you have a lay of the land of, of, of the landscape, the interpretations of Revelation fall into four main categories. You don't have to learn or remember these, but just so you have a little insight, I'm going to go over them with you now. So the first camp is the preterists, and these guys primarily understand all of the symbols and the events described in Revelation as having direct parallels with things that happened in the first century. So everything relates to something that's already happened, it's in the past, it's just a description of the time in which it was written, and that's the end of the story. The historicists, on the other hand, take a little bit of a longer view. So the historicists say, well, it did begin in the first century, but these images are describing very specific events which have happened throughout human history all the way until the end times. And so they attribute, well, this symbol means this thing that happened, and then in the 15th century, this thing means this thing that happened. And so they try and line those things up. One of his big weaknesses is that it really exclusively looks at the events of Western Europe as if the rest of the world didn't exist. So there's a problem there. The futurists, number three, uh, look at the book a little bit differently. They say these events, these descriptions are all about something that's going to happen in the future, in the end times. This is maybe the view that you are most familiar with if you've been in sort of the Christian ecosystem for a while, because these are the guys who have all the debates with one another about what goes where in the timeline, right? Is the tribulation before or after or during the rapture? Is the millennium a literal thousand years or is it a metaphorical thousand years? And all of those people are really, 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 really sure they are right. (laughs) The final group are the idealists. And the idealists just throw the whole thing out, typically. They view this all as symbolic pictures that are pointing to timeless truths, right? The idea of victory over good and evil, and it has nothing to do with any event in the past or the present or the future. Anyone confused yet? (laughs) Here's the thing. Fortunately for us, actually understanding God's heart for us in the book of Revelation does not require understanding or adopting any particular one of those points of view. In fact, getting the message that God has for us out of this book is available to everyone if we'll take the book's overall message whilst resisting the temptation to get overly enamored with all of those details. 
The commentator, uh, G.B. Caird, I think, gives us a, a helpful image. He uh, analogizes the book of Revelation uh, and all of its different moments and symbols and events a little bit like the little flags on the map table in a military war room. Right? You're familiar with the image. And it's this idea that some of those flags represent battles that have happened in the past, events already transpired. Meanwhile, some of the flags are the actual placement of actual people and events in real time. And yet more of the flags are plans for things that are going to happen in the future. And they all exist at the same time in the same room. In other words, there's a sense in which all of those four views actually perhaps have something to offer us. And yet, at the same time, whilst looking at them, we need to make sure that they don't cause us to miss the broader point, right? We're coming at Revelation the wrong way if we think that it's some kind of secret prophecy code that if we can decode it will tell us something about future events. So if we're not supposed to pay attention to those things, where should our gaze be? Well, one of the things it should be on is our scripture passage today, Revelation 21. So John tells us towards the end of this book, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the end of the story. We see this beautiful heavenly city coming down. It's a fully renewed, fully redeemed earth where God is finally reunited with his people. Now, I want to acknowledge right at the outset that for some of us, that image, that idea might be kind of new. Right? Because most of contemporary culture, and in fact even the mainstream Western church, often gives us a view of the end times or life after death that looks maybe a little bit like this image. Right? This beautiful image of a disembodied, sort of ethereal, glowy heaven. I certainly grew up believing and assuming that image by default. And maybe that's what you walked into this room with this morning. And in fact, there are a few, one or two Bible verses that would substantiate that idea. However, those are the vast, vast, vast minority compared to the overall thrust and vision of the Bible, which is that God is really, really interested. In fact, he's all about actively renewing and restoring his creation. That happens principally in and through the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus. But the goal is that one day all of creation would be made right. So N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar, says it this way. He says, the closing scene in the Bible is not a vision of human beings going up to heaven, as in so much popular imagination nor even of Jesus himself coming down to earth, but rather of the new Jerusalem itself coming down from heaven to earth. In other words, God isn't done with his creation. He's not, excuse me, up in heaven somewhere thinking, oh man, this totally failed as a project. We just got to throw this one in the trash and then we'll help humans escape like beam me up Scotty into heaven. He's not saying that. In fact, that's an idea that Christians for many centuries have mistakenly taken from Plato instead of from Scripture. What God is actually saying instead, he says, I'm completing the work I always intended to do. Making a perfect, beautiful, glorious world where human beings and all of creation can thrive and flourish without the destructive forces of sin and death. He's completing the work that he set in motion, right? Remember uh, week one of this series, God gives the cultural mandate. He says to human beings, fill the earth and subdue it. Keep on this work of creation. Make this world into the beautiful thing it can be. And he's saying, I'm completing that work. And the result we read in Revelation 21 is an absolutely amazing world. 
This place where the dwelling place of God is once again with people, where he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes, where there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain, where anyone who's thirsty can drink from the water of life without price, meaning there's justice and there's equality for all, where there's no need for a temple or a tabernacle because the Lord himself and the Lamb are there. They also don't need a sun or a moon, and it's never night because the glory of God is so radiant. God's making this perfect world that all of his followers get to really actually live in. Just pinch your arm for a minute. Do it for me. You too, Richard. (laughs) Right? That's how real the new earth will be. Just as physical as our actual bodies, the seats that we're sitting in, everything around us, it will be a real, actual, physical place. It will be beautiful and it will be perfect and we will be there forever. It's so good. Now, we might at this point ask the question though, okay, that's great kind of for one day, but why does it actually matter now? Why does it matter to me today or tomorrow when I'm getting on the train to work or taking children to school or struggling with this thing and that thing? Just doing the normal things of life. And honestly, the answer is, if we view this as sort of a far-off, one-day kind of thing, it's almost, and I emphasize the almost, like it doesn't matter. Or at least it matters only in the sense that we pray for it to come sooner, right? So John, uh, in the following chapters, he prays, come Lord Jesus, bring that reality soon. And that's a good prayer. But if we're just waiting for it one day, we can kind of just shelve this as good knowledge that we have. But I actually believe that even if it's not tomorrow, though it could be, right? Jesus tells us no one knows the hour or the day. There's still something for us in real time. Because for the book of Revelation, in the mind of John, the climactic event has already occurred. The climactic event is not actually Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem coming down. It's rather the victory of the slain lamb, which we know to be the resurrection of Jesus. That's the actual decisive moment in human history, and it's already happened. Meaning that this new age, this new age of wholeness and healing and restoration and most of all intimacy between God and his people, it's actually already begun. It's already here. It's already happening through the death and the resurrection of Jesus and through his church. And what Revelation 21 shows us and tells us is that God is in progress and he's going to complete that work. In other words, the reality of the new heaven and the new earth that we read about in these chapters, no crying, no mourning, no death, no sickness, no pain, is actually available to us, at least in part, now. I think that's something of what Jesus was getting at when he spoke to his friends in John chapter 10. When he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Notice two words that aren't in that phrase. He doesn't end it with one day. He doesn't say some distant time in the future they'll have life and have it abundantly. The entire sentence is in the present active tense. He says, I've come that they now, right now, might have abundant life. And as Katie talked about so well last week, there's this role that we have as the people of God, as the bride of Christ, as the church to, in a sense, take that reality of the new heaven and the new earth and pull it forward into our today, to bring it into our real lives, our real relationships, our families, our friends, to bring it into the real challenges of life, of of sickness, of of grief, of financial challenges for us and for others, to bring it into systemic issues of poverty and injustice and inequality. Actually, that's our role, to take that reality and bring it forward. 
What I think the book of Revelation causes us to do is to continually ask this question. To ask the question, what will blank look like in the new creation? I find that such a uh, comforting question to ask. What will provision look like in the new creation? What will health look like in the new creation? What will name a difficult relationship look like in the new creation? Let's do that actually right now. Do me a favor and just close your eyes. I'm going to have just a little prayer interlude. Let's close your eyes for a second. And just imagine a situation of challenge or anxiety or uncertainty or even sin and brokenness in your life right now. Just imagine that. And we pray, Holy Spirit, would you come into those things that we're holding in our minds right now? And as you imagine it, ask that question. What will this look like in the new creation. And just in a moment of silence, allow the Holy Spirit to to show you the answer to that question. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you're doing, for all that you're showing us. Amen. What we know for sure is that every place of of brokenness, every place of lack will be no more. And we can ask that same question about good stuff too. What will work and effort and accomplishment look like in the new creation and how do we uh, live that now? What will art and music and entertainment and beautiful things be like in the new creation? And how do we help create that now? What will the lack of poverty or injustice or racial tension look like in the new creation? And how can we be people that stand for that now? I think perhaps one of the things we have to most insert into that blank there is asking the question, what will the relationship between God and people look like in the new creation? And there's a couple of key verses, verse 2 and verse 22, that are on the screen now that, that, that show those. And there's this pervasive idea in the book of Revelation of the presence of God being with his people in a tangible, physical, real way that's unhindered, right? It's not restricted to a temple or a tabernacle or a select few people here and there. These verses about the the presence of God dwelling with his people, I think, would have been so important to John's original hearers. Why? Well, remember that this persecuted minority, they're absolutely powerless against the military and cultural and political power of the Roman Empire. And to them, it felt as though the empire, Babylon in the language of Revelation, was winning again and again and again. But they hear in these verses of Revelation 21, God is with you. N.T. Wright again says it this way. He says, what Jesus did, what God did in Jesus in him coming to earth, coming to an unknown world and an unwelcoming people, he's doing now on a cosmic scale. He's coming to live forever in our midst, healing and comforting and with his celebrating presence. Do you know that this morning, that the the presence of God is available to you? Paul says in 1 Corinthians that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, that, that even when the empire seems to be winning, when sin and brokenness, when lies and deceit, when even loss and grief on what scripture calls the the powers of spiritual darkness, when those things seem to be winning as they were for those first century Christians, God says, my presence is with you. Do you realize that this morning? Do you sense that even now, that he's here? 
He's with us. That's been my experience in recent weeks and months. The start of my year was honestly really, really challenging and really, really rocky in a number of different ways with a number of different reasons and causes. And in many ways, it felt like that same thing, that the powers of darkness were in some sense winning. And yet, in so many ways and so many times, my experience was that the presence of God had never been more real to me, that he made himself so real, so tangible, so close. Because here's the thing. The presence of God isn't something that we primarily know. It's not something that we primarily read about or even understand. It's something that we experience and that is actualized into our bodies, into our real life here and now. And the heart, ultimately, of the book of Revelation, in fact, of all of Scripture, is that God would, that we would know how closely God is with us, that he'd be fully and in an unhindered way united with his people. Do you sense that this morning? If you're going through a health crisis, that God is actually, really, tangibly right next to you and with you right now, If you're in a situation where you don't know how you're going to pay that next bill, do you know that in that, God is actually, truly, really with you by his spirit? When this thing or that thing, whatever it is that happens, do you know that he's with you? Not just in a I know it kind of way, but in a he's with me and his presence is getting into my soul and my body and my very being. He is here. I'm so absolutely convinced that in this particular season of our church, that that's the thing that God wants for us. That it's this greater awareness and experience of the absolute reality and tangibility and rock solidness of his presence. Not in a theoretical way, but in an actualized way with us. Amen? I love to pray um, that that would be true for us. Would you stand? with me. And um, if you resonate with that prayer, with that idea, I want to encourage you just to hold your hands in front of you as a way of saying, uh, Lord, I am hungry. I'm thirsty. I am eager for more of your presence with me. And so we pray right now, come Holy Spirit in a deeper and an even fuller and an even more tangible and realizable way into this space, into this room, into every one of our hearts, into every one of our lives. We say, you are welcome here. And Holy Spirit, we place before you every single situation and place and way where it seems that perhaps the darkness, the empire is winning. And we say, Lord, would you come by your presence? Would you obliterate all anxiety, all despair, all depression? We say, would those things be gone in the name of Jesus because of your presence that is with us and for us and constantly coming towards us? Just take these next moments and whatever you sense the Lord doing with you, uh, just say yes to it. You might sense even physically in your body some sensation of the Lord just letting you know he's there, a, a weightiness in your hands or a tear in your eye or whatever it might be. You might sense him speaking to you in, in just thoughts that are popping into your mind unexpectedly or, or a vision or a picture or a reminder of scripture. Just say yes to that in these next moments and receive from him.
And so God, we thank you that your presence is not something that we only experience in these corporate moments, but it's something that we carry and take with us. And so we ask, would you do that? Would you implant yourself so deeply in us that in every place that our feet go in this coming week, we would sense you right there with us. And we do join with the apostle in that that prayer at the end of Revelation. We pray, come soon, Lord Jesus. Do all that you want to do. We long for that day where there will be nothing standing between all of us and all of your presence. And to that we say yes, and we say amen.